Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're going to take an in-depth look at the Grand Cathay Tech Tree. Now this is an overview that will come in three parts. First, I'll briefly discuss the overall structure of the Grand Cathay Tech Tree and how it is incorporated into the Harmony mechanic. Then we'll take a look at each of the individual technology to look at their effects as well as the in-game lore. And finally at the end, I will compile the effect of the entire tech tree by categories such as unit bonuses, economic bonuses, and so forth with references to which technology provided which bonus, so you can reference the exact technology required for your desired bonus should you want to plan out your tech tree pathing for a future campaign. Now this guide is going to be rather long due to its comprehensive nature, so I have provided a detailed timestamp below for those who might be only interested in certain segments of this guide. Now getting things started, we have the Grand Cafe tech tree, which contains a total of 69 technologies divided into three identical structure sections of 23 technologies each. Each section of the tech tree is connected by a central line of technologies highlighted here. And for future references for the remainder of the guide, section one will always be using the green highlight, section two will always be using the blue highlight, and finally section three will always be using the purple highlight to provide clarity throughout the guide. Now aside from connecting the three sections, this central line of technologies also serves the purpose of dividing the tech tree into its yin and yang components as every technology above the central line are yang, and will provide at least one point of yang, while every technology below the central line are in, and will provide at least one point of in towards the harmony meter for Grand Cafe. Now, if you're new to the game and have no idea what harmony meter is, there is a link at the top right of the screen here that will take you to the harmony mechanics guide for Grand Cafe. For everyone else, just know that there are a total of 27 in and 27 yang technology here, and of the 27 pairs, 23 of them will provide one point of yin or yang. Well, there are four pairs that are being highlighted here that will provide three points instead. Now, lastly, all the technologies here in the first two section of the tech tree will take four turns each to research, while the last section requires six turns per technology. And since maintaining harmony is an important aspect of playing as Grand Cafe, a useful gameplay tip in regards to tech tree is that you should often research a given tech until they are one turn away from finishing. Then depending on your harmony requirements at the time, you can delay the completion of a certain in or yang technology by switching to a different technology to research. This way, you know you will always have a one turn in or yang boost ready from the tech tree to help you deal with unexpected events or when you want to recruit a new hero or lord into the campaign, as those also have yin and yang values. And even in the case where you don't have anything else to balance with your technology, by having your yin and yang technologies both at one turn, you minimize the amount of time you will spend away from being in harmony by completing the research in consecutive turns, rather than finishing your yin and then waiting for more turns for yang to balance things out. And if you ever feel stuck, you can always just focus on the central line here as those technologies are neither in or yang and will have no impact on maintaining harmony. Now moving on to the second part of this guide, we'll now be going over each of the technologies in order of their total research time, as we will look at their effects as well as their in-game lore description for those who are interested in Grand Cafe lore within the Warhammer universe. So starting with the Season Trackers, which is a free technology provided to all Grand Cathay factions at the start of the game, we have the description stating that The Dragon Emperor's Celestial Hand shall ease our path no matter what might assail us on the way. All we need to do is look for his radiance and follow after it. And the effect of this tech is going to be 5% campaign movement range for Yang armies and for In armies. And an army is categorized as Yang or In depending on the Lord leading it. If the Lord has plus three points of Yang, then it's a Yang army. If the Lord has plus three points of Yin, then it's an Yin army. But this is a default tech that requires zero turns as all Grand Cathay factions start with it. And if there's an interesting tad bit in the Lord description, I'll make a comment later. But for this one, there's not really too much to add here. Moving on to drill training, which will require four turns, we have Harmony brings unity and unity brings efficiency. The warriors of wind and field must be taught to trust one another implicitly, for each is extension of the dragon emperor's will, fight as one. So the warriors of wind and field 
is a general description for all the peasant unit in the army. In this case, we have an effect of plus four leadership for peasant along spearmen units. And at the end, we'll do a combined categorization of all these bonuses per unit, breaking down the effects you can expect for each unit type. So we're not going to discuss too much about the potential of how great peasant along spearmen unit will become. And the only interesting bit about this lore is the Warriors of Wind and Field, which will come up quite a bit in these lore descriptions. Then moving on to the Hardened Bamboo, we have a drying process topped by an ogre butcher, outcast from his tribe due to too many vegetable-based recipes, strengthens peasants' makeshift armor without rendering it brittle. So we have an improved bamboo armor on the peasant unit, giving us plus 10 armor, for peasant along spearmen units again. And this is a recipe from an ogre butcher. Quite interesting there. And as you might note on the top right of the screen, we have a code, 1-3. So each of these tech are gonna be given a code here, referencing which section of the tech tree they come from, as well as how early we covered it. And this will be used in the timestamp, as well as in the summary of the tech effect at the end. So you can reference back throughout the video using these codes rather than remembering the name of the actual tech to make things a little bit simpler. Then moving on, we have the fetching mentors. Because the Moon Empress blesses every arrow in the Celestial Empire, it is contingent upon our Fletchers to construct them with the utmost care and our archers to not waste even a single shot. So this is actually quite impressive. The Moon Empress is a very busy woman as we have a ton of range units in the Grand Cathay Army, and this will grant the Peasant Archer units 8% additional ammunition. Then moving on to 8 turn tech, we have the Jade Stance. As a majestic as Jade, as unbreakable as stone, this is what every devoted warrior of Cathay, whether born to power or peasantry, must eternally strive to be. And this will give us a very powerful boost actually, minus 15% vigor loss reduction, for Jade Warriors and Jade Warrior Crossbowmen units. So I think this bonus is going to be provided for different variants of the Jade Warriors and Jade Warrior Crossbow units. I'm not entirely sure because there are going to be text that says Jade Warrior with halberds and the Jade Warrior Crossbowmen with shields. So at the end of the guide, I'm going to just keep it strictly to Jade Warriors and Jade Warrior Crossbowmen because they didn't specify the varieties here. But I could imagine this is just applied universally across for all sort of Jade Warrior units in general. But the important thing about Vigor Loss Reduction, it gives you a small resistance to fatigue, which is an important point in all Total War games, as if you are fatigued, you can lose up to about 25% of your stats, and that will really render you much less effective in combat. Then moving on to Harmonic Balance Young, as the Dragon Emperor, once more directs his great compass to harness the eight winds, a great wave of yang shall infuse the land, bestowing good fortune and prosperity upon every soul. So this is a reference to the Dragon Emperor's uh, Wu Xing Compass, which is a faction effect for Grand Cathay factions, and its function is to capture the energy of the eight winds of magic and bless the land. In this case, we get plus five growth in all provinces, a very decent early game bonus to provide a bit of growth to get you started in all your provinces. Then moving forward, we have the Blessed Temple Guardians. It is said that each stone sentinel sings a constant and divine song of purification, sadly inaudible to all those not born of dragon blood. So those born of dragon blood are poor fellows, always hearing this song constantly, unable to shut it out. But the good thing here is it will provide minus one corruption for all provinces. Then moving forth, we have the opposite harmonic discipline in patience, planning and practice. This is the way of the in. Obey this creed always, and we shall move as the night wind, silent, graceful, and unimpeded by any obstacle. And this will give all your hero actions minus 25% cost. So this is for your two hero type. The alchemist and the astromancers and any of their actions against settlements against enemy characters against enemy armies will have a 25 percent cost reduction for agent action essentially then finally for the last eight turn tech we have the dragon scales strike fast strike hard no mercy it's a fine mantra but feudal should the enemy feel similarly defense is of equal import and uncannily lightweight 
alchemical steel shall provide it. We get plus 10 armor for Jade Warrior Crosswoman and Jade Warrior Crosswoman with shields. So this is where they will specify the type of units with different variety, which is why I think the Vigor loss reduction from Jade Stance is not going to be universally applied for all variants of the Jade Warrior and Jade Crosswoman. Then moving on to 12 turn tech, we have the Rite of Young. And before we confuse ourselves, these are 12 turn techs if you rush for them. If you dally around and pick up a bunch of different 4 turn tech, obviously you're not going to get the Rite of Young by 12 turns, but I'm basically going to order things by how fast you could reach it, theoretically, if you went for it directly. And this one has the lore description. The School of Feng Shi Sorcery, named for the Dragon Emperor himself, grants strength and protection to all those who wields it. It is the highest honor to march beneath the Yang Banner. And this one will grant you a banner. It's called the Banner of Feng Shi. And you can assign it to any given unit, and that unit will have the attribute of immune to psychology. So a little bit of lore here. In Chinese characters for the game, the translation of Feng Shi, uh, it's a character for divination using the wind. I think it's a play on word for Feng Shui, which is the study of you know how things are placed in harmony uh, in Chinese culture, especially with architect and placement of buildings and tombs. And there are going to be a lot of cases where they're going to pick slightly different characters to reflect real world practices. And I think Feng Shui is one of them. So it's slightly different from Feng Shui, which is going to be weird because I want to pronounce it that way each time, but it's actually a different character. I double checked using the Chinese localization for the game. So this one is going to give us a banner that will give our unit immune to psychology. Only one unit though, so pick carefully. Then moving on, we have the inner chai. And stillness of the mind and soul are virtues to which we all must aspire. Only with impeccable discipline and balance may we truly prevail against wickedness. So once again, we have sort of a play on word, inner chi, I guess, uh, to get the inner balance of harmony within oneself. And the effect is a little bit weird here because it's going to be related to the income from sacking settlements. We get 10% extra. So a bit unexpected in terms of what we get, but having some sort of income boost for sacking settlement is pretty standard for Total War games. Then moving forward, we have contained aggression. Cathay's provincial troops are loyal and numberless, but they are crude and unrefined soldiers. There is such a great potential in them, waiting only to be unlocked, and we get plus four melee attack when attacking. This is actually a pretty decent boost, as melee attack does add up, even in small incremental boosts such as this. Then we have the Alchemic Mortar, the House of Secrets refuses to disclose quite which reagents have been added to the mixture, but there's no denying that it builds sturdy structures at minimum cost. And this one's going to give us 5% construction cost discount for all your provincial and settlement capital buildings. And this references the House of Secrets, which will come up quite a bit. This is sort of a secret organization within Grand Cafe of banished wizards, essentially. So sort of magic users that have become illegal outlaws within the empire, but because of the organization's ability to research incredible technologies and magic abilities and their willingness to share it with the Dragon Emperor, so they have been allowed to exist and kind of practice their magic in peace despite being outlaws essentially. Then moving on, we have the harmonic balance of in As the moon's silver light washes over us, Gui Yin shall grant her blessing. Darkness shall hone our blades and shadow shall form our armor. So Gui Yin is the name of the Moon Empress. She's also a dragon, and as her name suggests, she symbolizes the moon. In this case, we get plus four melee defense when defending, sort of the opposite effect of contained aggression, which balances it out on the structure of the tech tree. Then moving on, we have the harmonic mastery in true balance requires the trust and participation of all souls. Only when we think and work as one, will absolute harmony of purpose be achieved. And this is going to give us 10% additional income from cities. And this is going to be all sorts of city income, I assume, or rather perhaps the capital building income uh, from your settlement capital, which I believe are city income, because later on we're going to have one that says income from industries, whereas industry is the infrastructure building type that provides income for Grand Cathay factions. So I suspect this one's only going to be on your settlement capital as it is also opposite of the income from sacking said settlements from the inner chai. Then moving on, we have Grace of Guiyin. The Moon Empress 
loves every child of Cathay dearly, but she must favors those who show fealty to the elemental winds of shadow and spirit. And this is going to grant us yet another banner, the banner of the Moon Empress. And whomever you assign this banner to will gain the attribute of stock for the sign unit. Finally, moving up to 16 turn tech, we have horse bonding. Cathayan horses are no less flighty than their otherwise inferior old world kin, but an expert rider knows that bestowing stillness upon their anxious steed is paramount to victory. And we're going to get a 10% charge bonus for all cavalry units, and there are going to be three cavalry units for Grand Cathay at launch. We have the Peasant Horsemen, we have the Jade Lancers, and finally the Loma, or the Great Loma Riders, I think they're called. And the thing about the 10% bonus is not going to be very big. The highest charge on a Cathayan cavalry unit is going to be the Great Loma Rider at 75 base. So you're going to get about a 7.5 increase there. I believe the Jade Lancer only has about 48, and I think the Peasant Horseman is at 36. So not a huge increase here because it's a percentage boost, but it's still something. Then moving on, we have the inner speed. Once freed from doubt, fear, and distrust, their minds govern only by their absolute devotion to the Dragon Emperor. The Celestial Legion shall move like the eight winds themselves. And we're going to get a 5% speed boost for young armies. And this is also going to be the plus three young technology for section one. There's a pair of these plus three value ones, and this is the one for the young. Then moving on to improved braziers, we have a system of bellows and fine brass funnels ensures that escape heat is recaptured and reused rather than wasted, thus granting greater lift and range for our Sky Lanterns, and we're going to get plus two recruitment rank for Sky Lantern units. Then moving on to administrative subsidies, we have every soul in the Celestial Empire, no matter how low born, is deserving of the Dragon Emperor's care. It falls to Yuan Bo the Jade Dragon, to share his purse amongst the common folk. And we have an upkeep discount for all three types of peasant units. So we have a reference to another one of the dragon children, Yuan Bo, who is the Jade Dragon, ruling in the capital, administering for his father. Well, Mao Ying is the eldest born of the dragon children, of the Nai. Yuan Bo, given his name, because Bo is often used for style names in Chinese as the eldest born son, it's probably the case where he is the oldest son and thus sort of the crown prince, which is why he is dealing with the administrative duties of ruling the capital while his oldest sister is in charge of defending the great bastion in the north. And we're going to see his reference a couple more times throughout this tech tree. Then moving on to Charlonian stance, we have the Dragon Emperor has seen countless species rise and fall, and can teach us much of them. The ancient Charlonian turtles possess nay unbreakable shell. This we can recreate with wood and steel. And this is going to give us plus four melee defense for all peasant long spearmen unit. And of course, the Charlonian turtles is a reference to the four cardinal Chinese beasts. In this case, will be the Xuan Wu. It's a turtle of the north. And later on, we're going to also see the firebird of the south, also referenced in these lore descriptions. Then moving on ahead, we have the In Hex. The moon empress shall bind our foes in tendrils of night, and in balance her kiss shall grant our bows new strength. And this is going to be the three in harmony, technology for the first section, and this will lower all enemy hero action success chance against in armies by 10%. Finally, the last technology on this section is the defensive formations. Absolute discipline, perfect alignment of purpose, every soldier knowing their place. This is the harmony of stone and steel, and this will grant all armies plus four leadership when defending. So that's going to do it for the first section of our tech tree. As we move on to the second section, we have an identical structure here. And kicking things off, we have dynastic finishing. And this, along with every single tech in this section, will also be four turns. And in the description we have, there are those who obtain status through ignoble means, and there are those who debase their heraldry. Fortunately, true dragon blooded may replace them at a whim. And this is a reference to the two different type of lord you can have while playing as Grand Cafe with the Dragon Blooded or the Shugun Gins, a special type of lord that is related to the dragons. 
as they are basically mixed blood relatives of the dragon siblings uh, from crossbreeding with humans. As you can see here, we are going to get Lord Recruitment Rank plus three for all lords, including caravan masters, which are going to lead your caravans on the Ivory Road for the caravan mechanic in the game. Then moving on, we have Improved Wenches. All the world envies Cathay's most grandiose technologies, but it is in the smallest of things, such as the cogwheels no larger than the hummingbird's eye, that we truly innovate. And this is going to provide 5% extra range for both varieties of the Jade Warrior Crossbowman. Then moving on to the Astromantic Choir. By putting Eagle to one side and working together, there is no limit to the innovations of the outcast sorcerers of the House of Secrets might devise. So we already mentioned these House of Secrets, and we have confirmation here that their sorcerers are actual outcasts. And the effect here is going to be increase one hero capacity for Astromancers. I think by default there are three capacity for Astromancers, and so now it goes up to four here. Then moving on, we have the Nengal Po Arms. The grand artificers of Cathay's impregnable heart of industry are capable of creating weapons repeatedly as everlasting as the Great Bastion itself. And this is going to provide plus four melee attack just for the halberd variety of the Jade Warriors. Then moving up to tech requiring 28 turns, we have the inner strength Yang. Yang is the strength of the soul. Yang is the flame in the heart and the fire in our veins. Yang is the roar from the lungs. Yang is the iron within our bones and the stone beneath our skins. And this is going to be a plus three Yang harmony tech with an effect of plus four melee attack just for Yang armies. Then moving ahead, we also have the Yang Kyrn. The Dragon Emperor's Celestial Fire burns hotter than all else. Bricks baked in the burning wing emerge strong and flawless. All the better to build great monuments to Shen Yang, which is the name of the Dragon Emperor. And this is going to give minus one construction time for all Yang infrastructure buildings. Then at the center of this section of the tech tree, we have the Peasant Levy Edict. The people cannot protest against the Jade Dragon's law if they are paid in the Jade Dragon's coin. And this is going to have the effect of plus two control in your own provinces when you have an army present there. And this is going to be an allied army. And this edict here refers to the Jade Dragon once again, which is Yuan Bo, the eldest son. And this is actually a pretty interesting reference to sort of an edict passed during the Song Dynasty of ancient China where we finally had professional soldiers for the first time. Usually throughout Chinese history, you had troops who were part-time farmers and part-time soldiers up until the Song Dynasty, where they actually implemented professional troops, not to improve the quality of the army, but to prevent protest as they gathered up sort of undesirable elements in society, whether you are a slight outlaw or convict, or perhaps you are landless or homeless, you ended up getting paid minimum wage to join the army just so that you wouldn't protest against the government. And this led to a deterioration of the army quality, obviously, which attributed to a lot of Song Dynasty's poor performances against the nomadic invaders throughout their history. And we see that similar idea here with the Jade Dragon's Edict with the Peasant Levy. Then moving on to Moonwood, we have previously unseen beyond the forest of the moon, a pitch black tree which yields lumber as tough as fresh forged iron, as spread to the slopes of Quinlan, no doubt with Gui Yin's blessing. So a couple interesting lore references here, as the effect of this will be minus one construction time for in-infrastructure buildings. And first we have the Forest of the Moon, which I believe is in the eastern parts of Grand Cathay. I could be wrong there. But the Quinlan Mountains is obviously a reference to the actual Kunlun mountain ranges, which many dynasties in China believes to be the source of the mandate from a dragon. It's considered a dragon's vein, as mountain peaks and valleys represented the flow of the dragon through the land, and often tracks the source of these dragon veins to the Kunlun mountain ranges. And you picked where you placed your tomb and where you placed your capital based on this. And this, once again, is going to be sort of a similar reference to a real world phenomenon or actual mountain range here with a slight change of character to Kunlan instead of Kunlun. And we have Guiyin once again, the Moon Empress. 
giving blessings to something associated with the moon, in this case, the woods from the forest of the moon, to use the lumber to help construct in infrastructure buildings a little bit quicker. Then finally, for the last 24 turn tech, we have the in defense. Our legion can learn to draw from within themselves an invisible miasma of the moon empress enduring love, which as it envelops our foes shall blunt their every strike. And this is going to be the plus three in harmony tech for this section, as well as providing plus four melee defense for in armies. Then moving on to 32 turn tech, we have the Sentinel Rites. It takes time for a newly awakened Sentinel to regain its full might as it sheds the moss and earth of years, but the correct incantations will instantly purge all such detresis. And this is going to give us plus five melee attack for the Terracotta Sentinel unit. Then moving on to the Harmonic Mastery Young, the Celestial Dragon will raise us all up. We need to only heed his wisdom, and so, by tapping the flame within their souls, the Dragon Emperor's soldiers shall become tireless. And this is going to give young armies another 5% campaign movement range. Then moving forward, we have the Peasant Triage. So numerous are the warriors of wind and field that it is impossible to keep a tally of the wounded. But learned physicians can at least identify the most grievously harmed. So this is going to be a triage of the peasants, which is the warriors of the wind and field reference again. And this is going to increase the replenishment rate for all three types of peasant unit by 15%. Then moving forward, we have the Sea Dragon Edict. Ying Ying rules over the Jade Sea and far beyond. And it's she who keeps Cathay's ports safe from crime and corruption. Only by the Sea Dragon's grace is fresh trade allowed or disallowed. So this is going to increase our income from ports by 25%. And we have a reference to another of the dragon sibling. In this case, we have Ying Ying, who is another female dragon. And she's the commander of the northern fleets for the Cathay army. And most of her references here will be related to the sea and trade in this regard. Then moving on, we have stalking techniques. What the warriors of wind and field might lack in formal training, they make up for with the willy skill of born hunters. And this is going to give stock to all peasant archer units. And this could be quite interesting depending on how stock is treated in sieges, in terms of how they get noticed by towns and towers and gates, as if they're able to maintain a similar type of invisibility as Three Kingdoms stock, then they can take cities quite easily for you, as many of those capture points can disable all the towers and buildables in that area. Then moving on, we have the in Muse. To drink of the Purious in Energy, Filter from the silver waters of the Dragon River, it is to become as swift and weightless as a spirit, unbounded by corporal convention. And this is going to increase hero action success chance for your own faction by 15%. Moving on, we have the Jagged Shrapnel. A crisscrossing of miniature blades within the gun's barrels interior scores hundreds of vicious edges into every piece of shot, only Nangao's most diligent artificers can achieve this feat. And this is going to increase the Iron Hell Gunner unit's armor piercing missile damage by 15%. And there are going to be a couple references to Nangao being the source of pretty much all of Grand Cathay's war machines and gunpowder units and guns, as it is the capital of the Gunpowder Road province. Then moving on ahead to 36 turn techs, we have the Jade Veteran Facility. It is the Jade Warriors who keeps the great cities of Cathay safe, but they are too gracious to demand promotion. Thus, we must identify and raise up their finest ourselves. And this is going to reduce the upkeep costs of Jade Warriors and Jade Warrior Halberds units by 5%, and also increase their recruitment rank by 2. Then moving on to flanking stratagems. So well drilled are the Jade Lancers of Cathay, and so fluid their steeds, that they could outflank their enemy even within the narrowest of alleyways. And very much like stalking technique giving stock to all the peasant archer units, here we're going to give what's called the devastating flanker for J Lancers. I have not actually played the game far enough to pick up this tech, but I would imagine this will give extra flanking bonuses for J Lancer units on charges which probably means it will remove more of the defensive stats on units as that's what typically flanking does in game, or it could increase their charge when you are flanking, as both of these options would make a lot of sense for something called devastating flankers. 
Then moving on to magnetic polarity. If the great magnets within the war compass are suddenly inverted, they will repulse incoming fusillades, scattering missiles like blossom on the breeze. So this is a reference to the Wuxing war compass unit. And since it is a compass, it is powered by magnets. And in this case, you can invert the charges, apparently, to repulse incoming missile fire. And it's going to grant the unit plus 40% additional missile resistance, which is quite an interesting game design using the fact that there are magnets in a compass cart to give it a little bit more missile resistance, which is both realistic and kind of neat in terms of just designs in the game mechanic. Moving on, we have the Nangao Forges. The great inventions of the City of Smoke generates more wealth than most other empires put together. We are fortunate indeed that it shares its technologies with us. And this once again references Nangao being the capital of Gunpowder Road, creating a lot of inventions of war, nicknamed the City of Smoke, giving wealth to Grand Cafe, and increase of 10% income from industry. Now industry is a type of infrastructure building for Grand Cafe. It is the type that gives income, so it makes sense that these type of infrastructure building will now get 10% additional income to your faction. Then moving on, we have Harmonic Ascendance. In the Cloak of Darkness is merely a state of mind. Practitioners of In can attune to it at will, and thus move unseen and unheard, even in the broadest daylight. And this is going to give you 20% additional ambush success chance. Then moving on, we have Wadding Cartridges. The ogre merchants of the Ivory Road charge a pretty penny to have their trained giants stomp on our cannon waddings, but the compressed results can be loaded with an incredible speed. So once again, we're getting some help from the Ogre Kingdoms to improve our weapon tree. Previously, it was the hardened bamboo armor for the peasant long spearmen. Now it's increasing reload time reduction of 10% for our grand cannon units. Then lastly, we have target ranges, a fresh edict. Only those born to a family which has known no short-sightedness or blindness for five generations may wield a jade crossbow. Even then, they must prove themselves. And the effect of this tech here is going to mirror that of the jade veteran facilities, which is going to give us 5% discount for upkeep for the crossbow variants of the jade warriors, as well as plus two recruitment rank for them as well. So now both the melee and range variants of the jade warrior is going to get minus 5% upkeep and plus two recruitment range. Then moving on ahead to section three, as a reminder here, even though the structure is the same, every single tech here will require six turns to research, and there are going to be four tech that's going to grant three points of in or yang, and we'll point them out as we cover them. So getting us started with Alchemist Compact, we have the House of Secrets, skirts the edges of morality and legality, but a carefully worded edict would farther legitimize its renegade wizards. In turn, it would share its best and brightest with us. And this is going to give one additional hero capacity for alchemists, as well as plus four starting rank for these two types of heroes for Grand Cathay factions. And we're going to see the full lore in terms of how the House of Secrets basically get by in the Grand Cathay Empire by sharing its inventions with the Empire in order to gain the rights to kind of toe the line of morality and legality in terms of their research. Then continuing on, we have Celestial Endurance Training. With Celestial Fire coursing through their veins, quaffed without hesitation from a Jade Goblet, the Dragon Emperor's Honor Guards shall never again know fatigue. And this is going to be the Celestial Dragon Guard units gaining 5% physical resistance. So basically, as we move into the third section of the tech tree here, we're going to be upgrading more of the Elite units, whereas the first section was more about the Peasant units, the second section was more about the Jade units, now we have the Celestial units. Then continue on, we have the Festival Edict. It is on the backs of the hardworking common folk that every noble of Cathay stands, and it is past time they were shown gratitude. Send forth for the finest dishes in all the Celestial Empire. And this is going to grant us four points of control for all provinces. Then continue to Jade Bolts by augmenting each missile's tip with a shard of the Celestial Dragon's most favored stone. They shall become able to pierce even the strongest steel. And this is going to increase 15% armor piercing missile damage for Celestial Dragon crossbow units. Now, of course, not only are every bolt and arrow blessed by the Moon Empress, now we have special tips made of jade for these bolts for the Celestial Dragon crossbow units. Although, physically speaking, jade is not a very powerful stone or a very tough one, quite brittle and breaks quite easily. Can't imagine it breaking any steel. 
but perhaps these are magical jade, who knows. Moving on to our 54 turn tech, we have the Enhance Young Sight. The Dragon Emperor sees all, and so it is that an infusion of his celestial magic can grant sight beyond sight to his most loyal believers. And this is once again going to be a plus three Young Harmony tech, and also going to grant Young Armies another 5% campaign movement range. Then moving on to the Grace of Shenyang, in public, all obey the Dragon Emperor without question, but in private, Many provinces vie for independence and power. Those who serve him faithfully shall be rewarded. And this is another banner, the Great Celestial Banner. And this one's going to give one assigned unit 20% ward save. And ward save in Warhammer is damage resistance to all type. So it's quite powerful here if given to the right unit. And here we have the first hint of all the dissenters and rebels that live within the Cathay realm. And it's understandable as we have these overlords of dragons that never die, that rules over all the human population. So it's common for some of these human lords to have dreams of independence. Then continue, we have the incorruptible dogma. Every child of Cathay is taught to fear the great enemy. But as adulthood descends, so too does temptation grow. Mandatory re-education and thrice daily prayer to the dragon emperor is thus required. So we not only have some fear of the great enemy, which I guess references all the chaos factions, but we also have more hints of people not liking the Dragon Emperor's rule and the need to re-educate them. And here we have the effect of minus 25% chance of plague spreading and plus four leadership when fighting the demons of chaos. And obviously the plague here will be referring to the Noggle plague spreading mechanic that we have to deal with once they neighbor us. Then moving on, we have the Grace of the Dragon Empress. Great feats of archery, great deeds of subterfuge, great acts of charity. This is how the Moon Dragon's blessed favor is won. And this is another banner, the Empress's Eye. And this banner is going to grant stock to one assigned unit in addition to 20% additional range. And this should be quite good on any of those range units, including Sky Junk which would be quite interesting to have stock, basically an invisible floating balloon that only becomes visible when you shoot out your massive cannon of fire rain rockets. And should you come under any flying threat and you have no one to help you out, you can definitely turn off fire well and just become invisible in the sky for a little bit until you have other unit take care of those enemy flyers and then resume your attack with your increased range. Should be a fun combo here. Then finally, for the last 54 turn tech, we have Moon Reflecting. Some mistake darkness for wickedness. Those who worship Gui Yin know that, in truth, darkness is purity, and to give themselves to the peace of night will answer their every need. And here we have the opposite plus three point of in for the harmony for this tech, and minus three percent upkeep for all in armies. Then moving on to 60 turn tech, we start off with the Long Ma Bridles. Every spirit Qilin yearns to return to the celestial mountains and have been known to depart for them even in the heat of battle. Encanting a young rite upon their reins will ensure obedience. And this is a reference to the great Loma. Loma meaning dragon horse, which is now confirmed to be a spirit Qilin, Qilin being the Curin creature. And this tech is going to give 20 points of charge bonus to the great Loma Rider, which is a significant boost given their base value of 75. So now you're looking at 95 plus that 10% boost from earlier for all cavalry units for charge bonuses. We're over 100 charge bonus now for the great Loma Riders, which although few in number, are extremely massive, yet very fast and versatile for the Grand Cathay roster. Then moving on, we have the Quinlan Anvil. Rare crystals litter the peaks of Quinlan each of which absorbed a fragment of the celestial energy unleashed by the Dragon Emperor's birth. Once socketed into an anvil, divine armor may be forged. So this is going to get plus 10 points of armor for all your celestial dragon guard units. And this once again confirms that Quinlan mountain range, much like the real world Quinlan mountain range, is the source of the dragon. And in this case, the birthplace of the Dragon Emperor. And these fragments of rare crystals can be bounded to anvils to grant them celestial energy and thus create powerful armors for the celestial dragon guards. And then moving on, we have the Thieves Guild. Retired gate masters with the Dragon Emperor's tactile approval often trained underworld denizens in the way of the Jade Warriors. In this way, 
even criminals are top balance. So it seems here, lore-wise, the Thieves Guild has the approval of the Dragon Emperor actually, and is trained by retired gate masters in the way of the Jade Warriors, which is quite interesting. And because they are thieves, we are granted 30% additional post-battle chance of stealing a magic item. And this is for all characters, which is interesting because it implies that perhaps this is stackable if you have a default lord, which is limited to one per army, but multiple heroes, which can each grant 30% since they are considered characters as well. So perhaps you can increase the percentage over 100 here and guarantee yourself the ability to steal a couple magic items from the enemy lord after the battle. And then we have the alignment calibration. A single brass lever activates thousands of pulleys arranged in a dense lattice even the most brilliant of minds could not untangle and quickly drags the compass into shuddering arrangement. And this is going to lower the Wuxing compass mechanic cooldown by one turn because there is a general turn limit in terms of how often you can turn the Wuxing compass to different directions. And this is going to increase the flexibility by decreasing the cooldown on how often you can change the direction on your Wuxing compass. Then moving forward, we have Clay Scrying. The Terracotta Sentinels are ancient indeed, but the Celestial Court believe it can recreate the invocations Shenyang used to infuse their stone forms with a semblance of life so long ago. So here we basically have court sorcerers trying to recreate the Dragon Emperor's magic of creating these Terracotta Sentinels from so long ago, and the benefit here is increasing the replenishment rate of your Terracotta Sentinels by 15%. Then moving on to powder mixing. When its powder is laced with deadly warp stone, courtesy of House of Secrets, ever-scheming alchemists, each fresh fire ring rocket can be produced for a fraction of its former costs. So here, once again, we have another dangerous experiment by the House of Secrets, adding warp stones to the powder used for the fire ring rockets. However, I wouldn't consider the 10% discount a fraction of its former costs. It's barely a discount. 90% of former costs doesn't sound like a fraction although you can argue Night Tenth is a fraction after all. Then moving on, we have Crane Sights. Vermilion Warbird hatchlings, before they reach full and fiery maturity, may be used as spotters, scattering harmless dancing flames in the vicinity of Crane Gunner's distant targets. So here's our reference to the Southern Cardinal Direction Beast, the Vermilion Warbird, which is sort of a phoenix creature, similar to the Northern Turtle that we referenced earlier on this tech tree. And these hatchlings are being used as spotter units for the crane gunners, thus increasing their armor piercing damage by 10%. Pretty interesting lore here added in with the crane gunners long distance on their shot. I think the range is like 275, which is fairly impressive. Then moving on to 66 turn, which is the longest amount of time required if you are rushing for one of the tech on the tech tree here, starting with improved husbandry. The moon empress can take in any form. And it is thanks to her time spent running with the herds, free as the wind, that we may now learn the language of horses. And this is going to decrease all cavalry units by 5% upkeep. And it seems the Moon Empress is just super busy. Blessing every arrow, planting tree from the forest of the moon in the Quinlan Mountains, and now transforming herself into a horse so that she may spend time running with them and learning their language and improving the cavalry of the Grand Cathay army. Then moving on, we have the Dragon Fleet Aegis. But a word from the Sea Dragon is all that is required to grant passage or permit. We may also petition her for aid in constructing coastal defenses for what is the ocean but another bastion. And here we have decreased construction costs for all ports by 25% and decreased construction time for all ports by two turns. Now, there are not that many ports on the map for Grand Cafe, as far as I remember, although there are a couple of river spots, so perhaps those have ports, but I believe most of the ocean-facing one in the south are not actually connected to the ocean. Perhaps in the future when the map expands or when you expand out of the Grand Cafe region, this might have more effect, but it's a very late game tech, so perhaps you would be out of the Grand Cafe starting area by that time, and perhaps you would have more port access. But it is definitely on theme in terms of lore, with the Sea Dragon returning with more port bonuses. Then continue on, we have the Young Reflection. Some say meditation is relaxation. This is grave misconception. For Young Meditation amplifies the will and dampen all need. 
its most capable practitioners can go days without rest or fodder. So in terms of effect, this is going to be a plus three Young Harmony tech, and it's also going to reduce the upkeep of all Young Armies by 3%. And this is actually akin to some Taoist and Buddhist meditation, where you go days without food here, or basically fodder. And that's kind of interesting here. Then finally, we have the Dragon Emperor's Blessing, which is technically the last tech on the tech tree, but since we're covering these from top down, we have a couple more to cover. But here we have, by harnessing the magic of Azir, Shenyang may divine what is to come, and thus he shall know the hour of our need. When he tells his faithful that hour has not yet come, they shall believe him. And this is just another excuse for the Dragon Emperor to be lazy. I'm not helping you because I don't need to help you because I can divine the future. But it does give everyone minus 5% upkeep, which is actually pretty powerful. Then going down to in healing, the Moon Empress weeps for every fallen child of Cathay. For this reason, she has been known to walk amongst those who follow her creed, disguised as a peasant healer, tending to the wounded and dying. And this is a complimentary plus three in harmony tech, and we have plus three percent replenishment rate for all in armies. And once again, Mu Empress, super busy, now disguised as a peasant healer, tending to the wounded and dying. Then we have the in flow. Come the next rainstorm. A system of canals and reservoirs can capture and share the Dragon River's overspilling mystic water far and wide, and thus the inn shall flow. And this is related to trade, 10% increase. And obviously, the element of water is often associated with inn, with fire representing young. And finally, for the last tech of our overview, we have the sky junk rigging. When not dousing the Dragon Emperor's foes in purifying fire, the dragon fire throwers mounted upon a sky junk's perimeter can belch their emissions towards the craft's rear, farther increasing thrust. So basically we can fire backwards to move faster, and thus we get 20% speed for our sky junk units, which is actually much needed. They're a fairly slow unit, so they could get overwhelmed by some cheap flying units pretty easily. You have to protect them with some either air support or some ground range units to help them defeat those flyers. And that's going to do it for an overview of all 69 tech. Hopefully you found this helpful. And to make things make more sense collectively, we're now going to take a look at all these bonuses categorized by type. And I'm going to reference exactly which tech these come from with the code that we're using so that you can refer back to our overview if you want to confirm where they are. Or perhaps the number gives you a general idea of where they'll be found on the tech tree. Now, because the timestamp limit on YouTube, I can only have up to 25 timestamps. So I can't exactly timestamp every single individual tech since there are 69 of them. So I'm only going to timestamp the sections of the tech tree. And hopefully you can sort of eyeball back to the positions within each section to find the tech that you're looking for. Now, to kick things off, we're looking at all army bonuses. And at the end of all our tech, once researched, we'll have plus four melee attack when attacking, plus four melee defense when defending, plus 20% ambush success chance, plus four leadership when defending, plus four leadership when fighting demons of chaos, minus 25% chance of plague spreading to our armies, and minus 5% upkeep. Then for young armies, we get additional bonus of 15% campaign movement range, plus 5% speed for all units, plus four melee attack, and minus three upkeep. Then for in armies, we'll get plus 5% campaign movement range, minus 10% enemy hero success chance, plus four points of melee defense, minus 3% upkeep, and plus 3% replenishment. Then for our lords leading the armies, we have plus three recruitment rank, and plus 30% post-battle chance of stealing magic item. For heroes, which are alchemists and astromancers, we have minus 25% action cost, plus one capacity to astromancers, as well as plus one capacity to alchemists, plus 15% action success chance, plus four recruitment rank, plus 30% post-battle chance of stealing a magic item. Then we can also have access to four banners, which can be assigned to individual units. Banner of Feng Shi, which gives immunity to psychology. Banner of the Moon Empress, giving you stock. The Great Celestial Banner, giving ward save of 20%, and Banner of the Empress's Eye, which gives stock and a range increase of 20%. Next, for the Wuxing Compass mechanic, we have minus one turn cooldown. And in terms of settlement management, for all provinces, we have plus five points of growth, minus one corruption, 
plus two points of control when armies present or plus four points of control regardless. And we also have income boost of 10% to sacking settlements, 10% to cities, 25% to ports, 10% to industry, and 10% to trade. Lastly, for construction related discounts and bonuses, we have minus 5% construction for all your capitals, minus one turn for all young infrastructure, minus one turn for all in infrastructure, minus 25% cost for ports, and minus two turns for port constructions as well. Then looking at individual and unit bonuses, we have the Jade Warrior gaining minus 15% vigor loss reduction, minus 5% upkeep, and plus two recruitment rank. Then for the Halberts variety, we have plus four points of melee attack, minus 5% upkeep, plus two recruitment rank as well. And for the Jade Warrior Crossbowman, minus 15% vigor loss reduction, plus 10 armor, plus 5% range, minus 5% upkeep, and plus two recruitment rank. For the shielded version, we have plus 10 armor, plus 5% range, minus 5% upkeep, and plus two recruitment range. Basically, we took out the minus 15% vigor loss reduction because I'm not sure if that is applied to it because it wasn't actually named as part of that bonus. Then for all cavalry units, we get 10% charge bonus and minus 5% upkeep. For Jade Lancers in particular, they can all gain the devastating flanking trait. And then for the Great Lomont Riders, we get 20 points of charge bonus. For peasant units, all peasants will enjoy minus 5% upkeep as well as 15% replenishment boost. For the Peasant Law Spearmen, we can add 4 points of leadership, 10 points of armor, and 4 points of melee defense. For Peasant Archers, they will gain 8% additional ammo and the attribute of stock. Iron Hail Gunners will get 15% armor piercing missile damage, and Crane Gunners will get 10% armor piercing missile damage. Grant Cannons will enjoy 10% reload time, and Fire Rain Rockets will get minus 10% recruitment cost. Finally, for the Celestial Dragon Guards, we get plus 5% physical resistance and plus 10 armor. For Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen, plus 15% armor piercing missile damage. Sky Lanterns will get plus 2 recruitment rank, while Sky Junk will get 20% speed. Then Terracotta Sentinels will get plus 5 points of melee attack and plus 15% replenishment. And finally, the Wuxing War Compass will gain plus 40% missile resistance. So that's going to do it for the entire tech tree and for our overview here of the Grand Cathay faction. Hopefully you found this guide helpful and deserving of a like. If you're interested in more guides like this in the future for other Warhammer races, definitely consider subscribing to the channel as I will continue to put out previews and guides during the pre-release period leading up to the launch of the game on February 17th. So thank you all for watching till the end and I'll catch you all in the next one. Bye!